Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of The Detour. We're normally live, but we're not live this time because we pre-recorded a couple of interviews with some superstars in women's cycling. Uh, Johnny, uh, some interesting chats we've got on the show today. Yes, well, it's quite a big day for uh, Australia cycling too, as uh, with, with what's going on with Team Bike Exchange um, around the world. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking to uh, some of our leading female cyclists, um, two, two of the uh, the, the superstars uh, of Australian cycling. Yeah, and that's of course uh, Grace Brown, uh, who won the pun uh, the other day, and uh, Sarah Gigante, who's finally. Uh, racing in Europe, but before we go to Sarah's interview first, uh, Esteban's back, the smiling Colombian kangaroo, uh, winning a stage overnight at uh, Catalonia. We were only talking to Whitey a couple of days ago, and I think one of the um, fan questions was asking about Esteban's form, uh, and and Whitey explained how he'd been over to Colombia, and uh, it's just great to see him back on the top step, if he. Yeah, look, two great stages in a row. I mean, the stage he won was fantastic. But the day before, he got second. And I think that was just as good, if not better, because he was really closing on uh, Adam Yates. And so he looked super strong. So two big days in a row. Um, and it really uh, bodes well for him for this season because, look, he really uh, hasn't done in the last two years anything what we'd expected of him. You know, he was uh, heading to be one of the superstars of the of the Grand Tours, but through injury and, and, and uh, sickness, um, he just hasn't been able to get there. But, hey, he's back. He's back. Uh, we're going to have to get Esteban on the show. Um, probably leave him alone whilst he's at a race, but as soon as Catalonia's finished, we'll get him on and talk about his career and, and where he's at. But, uh, yeah, no, he's always good for a chat, old Esteban. And, and I saw on Twitter some some people were, when he um, won, were wanting to go back through the archives and have a look at some of the old backstage passes. And, and on this program, we talked about that famous stage when he made up a minute 30 on Contador. Uh, at the Vuelta, I think it was 2016. That's been taken down off YouTube, Ify. So, really? yeah, I think it must have been music rights or something back in the days when I used to pirate whatever I could. Really? I think what, yeah. Oh, spewing. It was spewing. a wonderful uh, uh, segment too because it really did uh, um, exemplify the best of of uh, what any cycling team could do. Just the, the raw uh, emotion in all of that. And I mm. love uh, the old sheriff, the way he uh, oh, said, yeah. played that one very well. Mm. Anyway. Damien Housen's right. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get that up in some capacity uh, on some platform. We'll, we'll work it out. But uh, let's get straight into the interviews. And here's our grab with Sarah Gigante we recorded a little bit earlier. So, Sarah, you've uh, finally got to uh, uh, get to the big time in Europe, which has been uh, held up for nearly a year with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What was it like to finally get there? Yeah, it was awesome. It felt really, really special to line up with my team again after over a year. So, yeah, I was back racing with Tifco Silicon Valley Bank, which was super cool, just the feeling of having your team around you. And, yeah, we all went with the shared goal, which was – it just felt surreal to be back doing what I love. And, yeah, racing in beautiful Italy was a fantastic way to kick things off. I've never raced there before, so – yeah, my first European World Tour race, and it was so fun. I, I really loved the course. So, Sarah, what was your plans originally last year? Obviously, the pandemic hit, but did you have a plan to sort of slowly introduce yourself into sort of European racing? Yeah, so I had a good plan. I was going to go to Europe at the start and then go to America, um, race some of the American season there, so some of the tours there, some American crits and then head back to Europe for the final couple of months of the European season. So it would have been a good mix. And I feel like America is a nice stepping stone between Australia and Europe in terms of racing, like the bunches in particular, but also like the speed and power of your competitors. So, yeah, that would have been nice. But instead, I'm kind of avoiding America this year because I don't have much racing and just going all in for Europe which is also exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need a lot of stepping stones, uh, Sarah, but anyway, mm -hmm. we, won't, we won't go there. But um, what was it like, though, uh, 
getting from Australia to Europe when you went, I mean, it hasn't been easy to get out of the country. What sort of process did you have to go through to get out? It was actually a bit stressful because I only um, just found out from my team, I think on the Monday, they sent me my flights for the Saturday. So I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do so much. So firstly, um, like the travel exemption, it, it's not too hard, but I was just stressed that I wouldn't get it back in time. So a travel exemption from the government to say that, yes, I need to leave the country for work. And then um, I also had to organise my PCR testing so that I could get onto the flight, which I actually messed up the date of, which was so stressful. So I had to get like a priority <laughs> one because I thought you meant to get it like 40 hours before, but it was actually like more than 48 hours, but then it has to be less than 72 before arriving in Italy. So I don't know how that was all meant to work. So I ended up just like super stressed on the Friday, like ringing, will you give me my result back by tomorrow? Cause I really need it. I was like, I can't leave. And I don't want to tell my team that I've messed this up. So, yeah, that was all stressful. And then uh, I, I'd actually forgotten to get my UCI licence, so that's another thing I had to do. Yeah, it was all a bit last minute. Um, and then I decided to drop down to part-time uni because by that stage I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so behind in everything. So I'm just going to try and do what I do well rather than trying to do everything okay. <laughs> So, yeah. Was, was, it, <laughs> was there many people on the flight? Because I've heard stories like I think when Durbo flew over, there was two people for the entire plane. I think there was 13 staff for those two guys. Yeah. we. I was in economy, but it felt like what I must imagine business feels like because the, what are they called, air um, hosts, the people helping, they would yeah. come around and <laughs> um, ask individually what what drink we wanted with our meal that kind of thing before the meals came out which is not how it normally works in economy and i had my own um yeah own road so just stretched out which was nice i slept really really well on the flight because i think it was more than two maybe 10 for the first flight out of australia the long one that was great yeah, gone are the days when you're sort of sitting on that row just praying that that guy doesn't come mm. on to cram in like sardines and it always <laughs> used to be with 10 minutes to go, just do my head in on those long hauls. Yeah. And, he weighed, and he weighed 24 stone, yeah. That's oh, yeah. He was <laughs> dripping in sweat because he'd run to make the flight. But, yeah. But uh, it, mu it must have been a relief once you finally landed. Um, how do you find even things like training out on the roads in Europe? Yeah, training's fine. I, I found actually landing a bit stressful. Coming from Australia, where we're really lucky to have pretty much no community cases, and then suddenly, um, I mean, I landed in Italy, and yeah, no one was obeying the social distancing in the queue, and I'm like, honestly, like the queue's not going to move faster if you stand like literally on top of me and like coughing onto me and everything. Mm. So I really didn't like the airport part of it. I was yeah. a bit stressed there but um once i got out of the airport and into the team environment it's been a lot better and, and i mean it, it does feel strange and sometimes wrong to be yeah out like racing and riding all the time even if we're in our so-called bubble like we're in regions that are in lockdowns and yeah red zones so it's a bit strange like we went to perry Bay. well that's another place but you know we did the perry Bay recon yesterday and they were in lockdown. So it did feel a bit, um, you know, a, a tiny bit uncomfortable to be just like riding around having so much fun. And the poor city that we were in had like 130% capacity in their ICU and no one was out on the street apart from us pretty much. So some mm. things are a bit odd, but it is like selfishly, it's really nice to be <laughs> racing my bike too. So yeah, I'm not sure what the right reason is. Now, I'd, lo I'd have love to talk to you uh, shortly about uh, your Perro Bay uh, recon, but first we need to touch on uh, the uh, Alfredo Binder, the, the uh, uh, World Tour race. Uh, there you are, nice photo of you up there. Now, they were raving about you in the in the uh, commentary on the television, which was fantastic to hear, and I watched the replays of the race. Uh, and you were right there at the point end. So take us through it, because it was a big race and you were, you, you were the leading uh, young rider, which you are now wearing in in, in the uh, in the world tour. So, um, tell us about the race. Take us through it. 
Well, actually, I have to just correct that because that's no longer true. I think um, Dupan, which GB awesomely won yesterday, that was so cool to watch. Um, the the rider that got second, Emma Norsgaard, oh. she's now winning. The, oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, so. sorry, Sarah, our research <laughs> on this show, again, is not <laughs> cherry ripe. <laughs> um, but for what yeah. a period there, you did have it. I did. Yes. I didn't get to race yeah. in it, but I, I had it. <laughs> yeah, that's um, it. Pretty cool. So, yeah, Binder was so cool. It was basically like one long lap with a – the longest climb was on that long lap, but still ages from the finish. And then after that, four finishing circuits of about 17 kilometres each, and they each had two short, like really short climbs, maybe like three, five minutes. I find that too short. Um, but, yeah, it was a really – really cool course because if you look at the race history anything can happen like big groups sprints have happened and Corin Rivera won a few years ago in like in a massive sprint and then um Casio Neodermas finished solo there and then uh, often it's also just like a reduced bunch sprint so like no one knew what would happen at all and I liked that so yeah I my goal for the long lap was yeah, basically, I want to get to those final laps with the leaders. So then, yeah, I can see what I can do after that. So um, my DS also wanted me to try to get in a breakaway, an early breakaway on the long climb. So uh, I think Brody Chapman, also an Aussie, we had the same idea. We were, I reckon I covered like 15 moves over the, it wasn't like up the climb, up the climb was fine, but over the top, there was like 10K of rolling hills before the actual descent before we dropped so yeah Brady and I were covering all the moves there trying to get in an EB but I think SD works always seem to be chasing it down so in hindsight I wish I didn't spend so much energy trying to get in a breakaway because it's kind of seemed destined to fail now that I think about it um but I made it to the the front um I mean I made it to the final laps like with the leaders anyway just in the bunch and then yeah, I mean, I guess it was a bit of a race of attrition after that. I tried to stay near the front for the – our team had, like, the key points, so basically turning into those two short, sharp climbs each lap. And, yeah, on the – I think it was the second last climb, the second last lap on the longer but flatter climb, I could I – was, I was in second wheel, and I was like, man, Ruth Winder from Trek, she's going pretty hard, like – this is actually starting to hurt. And I'd been feeling like really strong on all the climbs. I was like, man, hmm, she's climbing well. And then I look behind me and we have a gap to the rest of the field. I'm like, oh, that, that's why it kind of hurts. Like we're, we're riding off the front and then suddenly Ruth like stops. So she'd just done it like a, a massive effort to a certain point on the climb. And then I, I'm like, oh, what do I do now? Like, you know, my lead out buddy's gone. And then her teammate, Taylor Wiles, um, suddenly it, like, semi attacks over the top so now she's going max so I jump on Taylor and I'm still second wheel and the peloton I think they got back to us with Taylor's attack but they were all like super strung out so I was like man this is so good like second and I then yeah next minute I think I'm not sure who it was but someone in that the move that went hit next so I'd gone with Ruth and then I'd gone with Taylor and then next minute from from behind. So, yeah, I kind of wish that I was actually paying a bit more attention now. Like I was just like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like a wheel. And then suddenly like boom from, I don't know, 10 riders back or I don't know. They were just going a lot faster. By the time they got next to me, I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> there goes the move. So it was really cool like, trying to um, go at the climb after them. I, I was a little bit off the split, which is so annoying, but I was – I went past Wolsey Dynion and then I was with Spratty and Ashley Moomin Pazio and I think a Mobby Star rider. We were in a little chase group of, of four over the top. So it was like the leaders and then a small gap, annoyingly close, and then us four. And then the Peloton was behind. Unfortunately, we didn't work very well together. Um, so we didn't catch the leaders and we were instead caught by the Peloton. But it did feel really cool. To me, like, right there, I looked across, I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's Freddie. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's Ashley. Like, I was raising her on Zwift. And, I mean, you know, Freddie's the Aussie hero for all of us um, junior riders coming up. So, yeah, that was super cool. And then the last lap, I mean, it was really annoying. I think we were all banking on SD Works 
bringing the the breakaway back because they've won nearly all the races this year and they weren't in the mini move. So I only had one teammate there and I think Spratty didn't have any teammates until Lucy got back a bit later. So everyone was kind of just waiting for SD Works and they tried, but I don't think they had the like A team there. I mean, A plus team. They always have an A team, but they didn't have their A squad. So yeah, it was a bit annoying. I tried to attack on the last, um, both of the last climbs, but didn't get anywhere. And then we just sprinted home and my teammate came 16th, which is a good result for Lauren. I think that's her best there, which is cool. What What's the main differences you find from racing in Australia to once you get over to Europe? Definitely the, the bunch size and everyone's a lot, um, more fierce in the fight for position. So, yeah, really, I was proud of myself that I actually did get to the front for the two, like, turns into that short, sharp climb. But it was a lot harder than, say, that Nationals or NRS or even, like, a club men's crit. Like, well, I don't know if the men are just being nice to me, but they're so much easier to push around than these World Tour women are just... They're brutal. Like, <laughs> I'd, I'd much rather take on any of the A-grade men for a wheel than these these women. They're, they're fierce, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, how do you go with that being such a nice person? I mean, you'd have to get a <laughs> bit aggro once you hit the uh, cross the white line. I, I definitely – I'm very, very competitive, but I have to work on my, you know, elbows out. Although I yeah. – because I broke my elbow a few years ago and I got surgery, I do have a, like a – I don't know what's in it titanium reinforced elbow so maybe i should use that nice oh, pointy elbow oh yeah that sounds that's, that's a that i love that i love that now you're you're a tipco team american team but they're not world tour so that means you don't get to ride all of the races and of course you missed the the uh depana the uh, bruce depana just uh, yesterday as we spoke about um so what of the big races coming up which which ones are you getting Actually, we're really lucky because, well, not lucky. I guess my team earned it last year while I was in Australia. They did really well. Yeah. So even though we're not World Tour, we actually get invited to pretty much all of the races because we have a good um, UCI ranking. I think we're 14th or so. So I don't think we actually wanted to do Dupana just because oh, okay. of the kind of course it is. And we don't have the biggest squad here, so we kind of have to pick which races suit us or we'll yeah. all be racing every day <laughs> all the time. So, yeah, I mean, we have a great team schedule. I think on the schedule we have Ghent Wevelgem this Sunday coming and then Dwarves Van Vlanderen. Oh, this is really going to test my pronunciation and I'm so bad at yeah. these races. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. then Flanders, and um, we were going to do Kairi Bay and then that one that Grace won last year. And I, I told my t – I know the name. I know how it's spelled. I cannot say it. It yes. and like P I okay, I don't even know how it's spelled P I J the, something Bill's appeal or whatever, yeah, it is. yeah. Yes, I'm not like... gonna say it because I'll embarrass yeah. myself. And then, yeah, the our dance is what I'm most excited for. Um, we've got all of the like all three so Flesh, Amstel, Gold, and Liege, yeah, Best and Liege, yeah. which is so fantastic. cool. Oh, fantastic! That is sensational. Mm. Now, tell us about your recon of uh, <laughs> Paradise <laughs> Bay. What did you think of it? All I can say is that I'm less disappointed that it was cancelled than I was before because <laughs> I need more time. I wasn't on the roster anyway, to be honest, but I need more time to practice my cobbles <laughs> before I go do a muddy Perry Bay. Maybe in the dry would be fine. Like it wasn't – the gaps between the cobbles weren't as bad. You know, like you always hear people going, oh, my gosh, there's like tyre whips between every single cobble and you're like destined to crash. But – it was just my rookie mistake. <laughs> I went around the corner, like right into the mud, right through the mud. And then I was like freaking out. So I stopped pedaling. And you should never stop pedaling when you're <laughs> going slowly on couples in the mud. Yes. So <laughs> what have you heard? You, uh, what, what we're reading is that, you know, it came out, the major papers were saying that it had been uh, definitely cancelled, postponed till October. But now the minister has come out and said, well, it actually hasn't been cancelled yet. So officially yeah. it hasn't been cancelled. So what's the latest you've heard? Yeah, we've heard the same thing. So everyone thought it was officially cancelled. And then like two hours later, it's like, oh, wait, it's actually not officially cancelled. It's just like doomed. So we're, <laughs> we're all, I mean, we haven't taken it completely, like it's gone, but we're trying not to get our hopes up, if you know what I mean. Like 
because it's quite likely that it will be cancelled. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, we can hope. But, yeah, again, the ICU in the region was 130%, I think, when I checked last, which is pretty awful for the region. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, for sure. Um, so where are you going to be based uh, this, this season, uh, Sarah? Um, Girona, hopefully. So after Liège, I'll head over there and, yeah, no. hopefully get some of the Girona QOMs. I think yeah. they're the most hunted QOMs in the world. <laughs> know, know the place very well. Lived there for four years and couldn't speak Spanish by the end of it. Hopeless. <laughs> they don't even speak Spanish. I picked yeah, Spanish that's right. at uni. Yeah, oh, I yeah? actually picked it at uni like two years ago because I'm like, oh, I want to be a pro cyclist one day. This was before I was pro. I want to be a pro cyclist and live in Girona, so I'm going to learn Spanish. And then like after the whole year, so I did both semesters of Spanish. And lucky I love languages anyway, and I probably would have done Spanish anyway. But, yeah, it took me a year to realise that they don't even speak Spanish in Girona. Yeah. <laughs> so good intention. Uh, you, get a, you get away with English. A lot of <laughs> finger pointing. Always go to restaurants with menus with photos. And, yeah, you know, you'll be fine. <laughs> There's no drama. Well, um, is, if you could pick one race over the next sort of two months that you really, really want to do well in, what, what would that event be for yourself? I think Liège. Just, yeah. I've heard it's the hilliest of these Belgian races, and I'm only doing Belgian races for the next two months, unfortunately. <laughs> I really loved Italy, can you tell? Yeah, bring <laughs> me back. Two months, March, April, May. Oh, Turrigan starts in two months, so that's a cool tour that our team's hopefully doing in Germany. Okay. So, yeah, so you, uh, anything. Yeah. I think I can't be fussy. I'm, if you look at my results on um, pro cycling stats for Europe, they're not very good, so... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not picky. I'll do well anyway. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So the Women's Giro, which I think is in, during the Tour de France in July, is uh, uh, any chance you'd be riding that? Yeah, our team is scheduled. We've got our invite to the Giro, which is so cool. So, yeah, I'm really excited. Hopefully we get to race. Oh, I get to race. <laughs> well, you've got a pretty busy period coming up and uh, we appreciate you coming on the show again. Sarah, and, and wish you all the best for this big block of races. It's it's exciting times. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really yeah, excited. We'll, we'll definitely uh, touch base with you again um, during that time because I know that we're going to see you at the pointy end in one of those. So we look forward <laughs> to talking to you again. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for all the no support. <laughs> no, good stuff. Okay, Sarah. Bye. Bye Fantastic chat with Sarah. Uh, Ify, it's that time of the show where we've got to run through the sponsors and let's kick things off with Let's Go Motorhomes. Yes, Let's Go Motorhomes. Well, why not holiday in Australia and their Australia's best motorhomes and campers? They love helping people to have incredible holidays. As one of Australia's leading motorhome and camper van rental companies, they have vehicles to suit all types of travellers for all kinds of adventures. And you can be sure they'll go the extra mile to make you make sure you have the best road trip of all time. Travelling Australia in a camper van or motorhome is truly one of the best and safest ways to experience everything our amazing nation has to offer. Self-drive trip helps to set up the freedom and everything you possibly need. And there are five tips to make the most of your motorhome experience. Plan, 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 plan and plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, something I'm not very good at. <laughs> I love the spont spontaneity. I got the word out this time. You wrote, um, you wrote this script though, didn't you? I know, I know. So I why did. would you throw in the big words? Just kiss method, word, mate. Keep it simple. Word. It's a word that I use. It's, I actually um, pirated You use it, but you can't say it. <laughs> I, I pirated it off their website. But anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> when it comes to adventures, uh, travelling around Australia requires planning, So especially during peak time. So the thing is, the people at Let's Go, and give Andrew a call. He's the boss in there. And, and uh, they will plan. You just tell them where you plan to want to go, and they'll set it all up for you. I know a lot of Europeans would come over and come into Let's Go and say they wanted to get out and wanted to go to Ayers Rock and to the Barrier Reef. They were going to drive to all of that in about a week and a half. They didn't realise quite how big Australia is. <laughs> no. But at the moment, it's uh, it's it's all Australians who are doing all the hiring, so at least they know where they want to go. But but the, the gang in there will actually plan your whole trip. So uh, um, just tell them what you want to do, and they're, they're fantastic. 
Yep. And Jayco? Funnily enough, all of the Let's Go motorhomes are Jayco's, made by Jayco. You wouldn't uh, credit that, would you? Right? No. But uh, Jayco, Australia's leading uh, caravan company, um, and going gangbusters at the moment. I mean, everyone's getting out and holding around. I think it's 10,000 back orders at the moment. That's how popular they are. And so, you know, if you're in the market for a caravan, you would naturally go to Jayco, Australia's biggest. But if you've got the slightest interest in cycling, that gives you all the more reason to go to JK because they've been supporting cycling for a quarter of a century. So yeah. I think cyclists should get in and support JK. Yep. Jerry's given a lot to the sport. If you want to carry around, give some back. Exactly. <laughs> all right. And uh, if you do like a tipple, where else to go than Mitchell and Wines? Well, one of Australia's favourite wineries and a place of escape. Experience the history, the beauty, and the serenity of the Goulburn Valley at your own pace. Look over the vineyards from the iconic tower, stay in their new magnificent hotel, relaxing by the pool, recharging in the day spa, exploring the seasonal menu at the Muse, and stopping by the Provador and touring their cellars, and of course, tasting their signature wines. Recharge by the day and night in this in their amazing spa, uh, and you can get the best massages of all time. Uh, I had one there about a month or so ago, or maybe two months. And uh, yes, I got a smile on my face just thinking about it. Um, and of course, it's become renowned as an amazing venue for weddings and that special function. There's a happy couple right there. And so uh, they offer unique spaces for the weddings. There's a wonderful area uh, outside overlooking um, the, the Goulburn, which is just staggering. But there's also, you can get married underneath the big tower, down in the cellars. There's wonderful uh, uh, options uh, um, to, to host your major functions. Uh, and, of course, if you go down into the cellar, you can go and see uh, the world's largest private Aboriginal art collection, it is just amazing, absolutely glorious. And uh, there it is, the old ten thousand dollar Land Cruiser. Cruiser, <laughs> <With Gruber>. the, <laughs> it's a Gruber uh, uh, with the um, four million euro paint job. Four million. It's bounced around. For, I think it was four point three three the other day, but uh, <laughs> it'll be, it'll bounce back. Might even get to five. Now it's time for a quick word from our great mates at Bike Exchange. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs. Semi-amateurs. And pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on Bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns and rides. Thanks again to our great mates at Bike Exchange. They'll be up and about iffy with the results over the last couple of days for sure. Yes, and... Uh, what are you bikes? eating? <laughs> No, I'll just have a little snack in between things, yeah. <laughs> Susan well, it comes, I was like, right, I've got a minute. <laughs> Stuff my face. Well, I had, I had a sugar meltdown uh, a couple of days ago or, or yesterday, so I didn't yeah. want that to happen again. I didn't have a fade out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, mate. Well, uh, we pre-recorded this interview, so you didn't have a fade out for the grab with Grace. It was actually quite funny. So uh, let's, let's cross to that interview we did earlier now. Uh, we're joined by uh, Grace Brown, who's absolute superstar with Team Bike Exchange and has come off the back of winning De Punna. Now, back in the day, I, I remember doing De Punna with, with the men's team. It was a three-day race. It's now a one-day race. And you've gone out, attacked 10K to go, and you've held them off. How do, how yeah. do you feel? <laughs> uh, I still can't quite believe it, to be honest. Like, um, 
it's not it's not a uh, breakaway riders race really like it's always a race for the sprinters so I mean it was my only chance so I tried it um and I got lucky now yeah it was interesting. I, I loved the race, and I, I, I couldn't see all of it. Unfortunately, it wasn't all on TV here, but I watched all the highlights package. And just, it was an amazing race, actually. It just, things fell in your favour in that it was so hard and it split so much with the winds and everything. Um, and in the end, that small group, there were a lot of sprinters there, but they didn't have teammates to help them. So uh, that turned out to be a perfect move of yours at 10K to go. Yeah, I, I sort of read that the um, group that I was in was starting to be a little less cooperative um, coming towards the finish. So, yeah, I thought that perhaps they wouldn't be so organised in chasing if I attacked. Um, and, yeah, some of, them, some of the sprinters had teammates there, but, yeah, it was still just, you know, a couple of girls that were willing to chase, not the whole group. So that really came in my favour. Yeah. We're seeing this quite a bit, uh, even in the, the men's races, you know, the, the rider that has got the, the swingers to, to make that brave attack, you know, particularly when you get teams that are looking at each other and they can't coordinate the chase. I mean, and, and you look at results last year as well. Um, are these some of the best victories, those ones where the, the unexpected, you know, when you can hold them off, get to the line and just go, what the hell just happened? Yeah, totally. I think like if if you go into a race thinking that you're, you know, number one favourite and you've got a plan of how you're going to win it, then when you win it, it's sort of like you've already done it in your head, so it's less exciting. But um, yeah, this one, like completely unexpected, I think. And it was just, I mean, I'm still trying to get my head around it. But, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Did uh, I, I saw? I was talking to you off air. You're staying at the Leppel Bed, which is a, a, a big favourite uh, hotel of, of the team over many years. Did you get an extra bowl of soup on the back <laughs> of your victory? Yeah, we usually get soup every night, but I didn't get a bowl of soup last night. So, oh yeah, no, a bit, a bit ripped off. <laughs> Well, I famously made a lasagna for the team that year and uh, I think 70% of people got food poisoning, so I was banned from the kitchen. Yeah. It was a famous chicken lasagna, so I think particularly in COVID times, they probably clamped down a fair bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think we want food poisoning around here. No, no. So, I mean, what's, what's your schedule looking like, uh, particularly over the next uh, couple of months? Um, yeah, it feels like quite a short fast spring compared to I mean last year it was just back-to-back -back racing at the end of the season so um, this feels a lot more relaxed I've got um, Gent Werbelgum on the weekend and then the following um, Sunday is Flanders and hopefully after that we've got uh, Roubaix still on but um, yeah there's a bit of skepticism about whether that's going ahead at the moment and then, yeah, I'll race Amstel. Um, that will be my only Ardennes. Iffy. Okay. What about you? Are you not doing uh, Liège? No, not at the moment unless, yeah, unless something changes in the team. I'm not racing Liège, which is a bit sad, but. Um, so very strange. <laughs> I mean, you went second the damn thing last year. I <laughs> uh, no, I'm a little bit sad. But, um, you know, things still could change. I wasn't meant to race it last year and I ended up being there and getting a result. So maybe I'll, I'll be there this time. Oh, I would think. I, I, we'll have to see what we <laughs> yeah. do about that. We'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, may, maybe you can write a letter to us. Oh, you, you'd, you'd be, you'd be surprised that... The amount of power that Johnny Chavot has behind the scenes. Just send us the race calendar you want for the rest of the year. We'll get it sorted. No dramas whatsoever. Uh, whatever. You're going to cause trouble here, John. John. Now, you, you didn't mention the uh, the, the, Brantz, the Brantz appeal, which you won last year. You didn't yeah. mention that. When, when does that slot into the... Uh, yeah, well, maybe I will end up doing that because um, it's meant to be after Roubaix so I think it was a little bit too close to um back up um after Roubaix but now if if Roubaix doesn't go ahead I might do Brabant's 
which will be fun to line up as reigning champ. Yeah, for sure. You, you've obviously got super form again, uh, Grace. How are you feeling confidence-wise coming into this year? Um, well, particularly after you know the results the other day, you must be up and about. But are you, are you going in with a different mindset from, from last season? Yeah, I definitely have higher expectations on myself. Like I know what I'm capable of now and um, want to do my best at every single race. But, yeah, these these Belgian classics are really, like, you can never be too confident because so much can happen in them. Um, and I've still got a lot to work on, yeah, in terms of making the race easier for myself and not wasting energy where I don't need to. Um, so even if I feel great, you know, in my form, um, yeah, there's still a lot of other factors that aren't quite certain. What are the? I was going to say, have you noticed? Have you noticed? Just treated with a bit more respect in the peloton now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Like from the last couple of races at the end of last season, I started noticing um, a, a different sort of feel riding in the peloton, and a lot of the girls know who I am now. And um, yeah, just just a bit more respect. I mean, it's never. It's never easy to move around the peloton and no one ever gives you a wheel for nothing. But, um, yeah, there has been a change. Yeah. Well, we were talking to um, Sarah Gigante and uh, she obviously had her first race in Europe and was just super excited. And, and particularly for these young riders, is that is that the biggest thing with the evolution of your career, learning to, as you said, how to conserve energy and not cook yourself throughout that race? Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, you can be super, there's so many riders that are really, really strong, um, but they, yeah, they never make it in the race winning moves because they've spent energy in the wrong places or, you know, you're out of position um, and you can only make up so much of that uh, by being strong. <laughs> There was a lot said a couple of weeks ago, just off topic, about um, the team announcing that they're going to be paying the women uh, minimum wage to match the men's. Um, that was obviously something that it must have been a um, you know, pretty positive uh, story for you guys, given that, uh, I mean, it, it should be the norm. I mean, John, you put your hand up saying that you were the first, was it the first race to pay equal prize money back in the day? The Bay Crits, of course. Yes, we're glad you put that in. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm not always having, I'm not always having sharp dicks, but <laughs> yeah. it, it must, have, it must have been good uh, for the group. Yeah, no, I think there's definitely um, a positive energy in the group, and uh, a lot of the girls feel really valued by the team now. Um, yeah, it's it's an awesome step forward for women's cycling. I mean, really, it should. It, should be the case from a long time ago but um you know the the sport's not not that old um for women and we've seen a lot of progress in the last couple of years and i hope that it continues to pro progress in that way um and yeah the salaries across the board begin to look um a lot much more like the men yeah and hats off to Jerry, uh, Ryan, because he was the first World Tour team uh, to, to start a women's program. Uh, and now I think he's a, the second team to, to um, do this uh, parody with a, with a basic wage. So, look, it, it's fantastic. But you just touched on something there now, on, on how um, you know, the pro women's racing still in its infancy in lots of ways. I've just noticed in the last two years how much – uh, better the racing is itself, better to watch. And just the coverage on television now is so much more uh, and the, the feedback, social media, people are much more interested in the women's races, especially in the last 12 months. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the racing's always been pretty exciting, but definitely having more broadcast and better broadcast, like a lot, a lot of the races in the past just had, you know, some guy on a moto um filming us from the back of the peloton with you know, no commentary. Um, and now we have a proper setup with, 
you know, helicopter images and multiple cameras in the peloton and proper commentators explaining the racing and knowing the riders. And yeah, it's really exciting. You get to know the individuals in the peloton. Um, and I think fans are a lot more engaged. Uh, you mentioned that you got Gert Welvingham on the weekend. What are you expecting from that race? Um, yeah, it's it's a good race. It's it's another one that um, really changes with having a bit of wind. With, there's some hilly sections in, in the middle, but um, it usually splits up with good crosswinds. So um, hopefully we get some good Belgium weather again on the weekend and... Um, We'll see some similar racing to yesterday. And unfortunately, I saw um, Jess Allen broke her collarbone. Was it? So she she's going to be out of action for a while. Um, and was was there another rider that crashed as well? Yeah. So Jess came down, broke her collarbone. She's in. Um, she's getting surgery today to fix that up. But she seems in good spirits, which is which is nice. It's, Bit of a mixed feeling when you have teammates come down and hurt themselves and and also you know winning the race mm. is sort of celebrating but also yeah the, it's a little bit down at the same time um and yeah sarah roy came down sort of right before the decisive move happened and ended up in a ditch and got prickles all over her and fell in some water um so that wasn't such a good day for her either yeah. She's okay. She's okay. She hasn't got any injuries out of that. Yeah, no, just um bit of bit of stinging nettle and prickles all over herself. <laughs> and I think a bit of Belgian uh Belgian swamp water. Uh, uh, so hopefully she doesn't get sick. <laughs> no. Well, uh anything you want to add, Ify, before we let Grace go? Well, I, I have woken up in a couple of those uh, brackish br- uh, Belgian uh, side waters in the past, but uh, that's for oh, a different dear, reason. Don't, yeah, don't, don't tell us anymore, John. <laughs> no, no. We're, we're not live, but you can just sort of end it there, Johnny. <laughs> um, look, uh, it was fantastic to, to, to spend some time with you uh, ladies uh, in the summer at the, at the end of uh, – of the of the nationals on that, we had a, a, a wonderful uh, cruise up uh, up the Goulburn with uh, uh, Jess, as you just mentioned, and, and Sarah, who were uh, out of action now, and yourself. We, we had a lovely day, um, and I'm, I would love to be able to get over there this year. I'm still sort of trying to twist a couple of arms and to get over and uh, as team mascot and to come and. Uh, uh, see a little bit of the, the women's uh, at Giro and the, and the men's Tour de France, but we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Well, <laughs> hopefully you can uh, – yeah, it sounds like the um, vaccine's being rolled out pretty quick in Australia now, so hopefully you get that and jump on a plane over here. Well, I'm 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 in the old farts. Uh, I'm an old farts. So I'm I'm qualified <laughs> to get the vaccine right now. So, <laughs> well, what awesome. are you waiting for? Get your jab and get over there. You're in charge of all the um the race programs now as well. So yeah, the social, pretty... social director. That's yeah. right. <laughs> uh... We need a bit more fun over here. It's all business at the moment. Well, what are, what's the COVID restrictions like around um, where you are? Because, you know, I used to love just going for walks down, get the triple fried chips, you know. Mm. Uh, you, you wouldn't really have as much freedoms as you used to. No, it's um, it's a lot less fun than usual. We, we're sort of stuck in the team bubble. Um, and, yeah, it's basically just a race, train, eat, hang around, level bed. Um and then, yeah, if, like Belgium in general um, is tightening their restrictions as well. So basically all restaurants and everything are closed. Um, you can still go and get takeaway, but, yeah, we're not really meant to. Yeah. So what's the vibe with with these races? Even though the racing's fantastic, the coverage is fantastic, there's hardly any crowds uh, because you know, they're, they're not allowed. Um, so how does that feel for you? Do, do, do you miss that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's still um, the diehard Belgian supporters that sneak out um, onto the course and, uh, managed to cheer us on, but I don't think they're meant to be there. Um, 
But, yeah, I think really at the finish line you notice it mostly. Um, like especially yesterday winning, you sort of come across the line and, and then there's just like only staff there. <laughs> mm. um, there's less of that sort of buzz, um, which I think is a bit missed. But, um, yeah, the, the ra- it doesn't change the racing. You're still you're in race mode and you, you're you're going for it just as hard as you would regardless of whether there are fans or not. But, yeah, it would be nice to have everyone there. And have you got aspirations to be at the Olympics this year with the with the road team? Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, aiming to be on the team for both the road race and hopefully the time trial as well. Yep. Um, yeah, and then also the World Championships this year are in the Flanders region here. So that's another big goal. And is there any update regarding the Olympics? I think they should be pretty much good to go, you'd think. Yeah, well, they um, sent the torch off, I think, a couple of yeah. days ago. So that's that's looking good. They've um, yeah announced that there's definitely no international spectators, which was expected. But, um, yeah, it's still all seems to be going ahead. Johnny couldn't help himself. As soon as you <laughs> mentioned the torch. I got the torch. <laughs> oh wow! You must be very important. <laughs> oh, yeah. I ran uh, with that in uh, uh, two thousand in my old hometown of Morwell, which, which was fantastic. Actually, it was a wonderful uh, um, uh, opportunity to to do. I was, uh, yeah. It's actually the reason I gave up smoking. I remember it was in the two thousand two in France, and when I came back from that, I knew I was going to have to uh, to run with the torch. So I thought. I better give up the fags. And that was, and I haven't had a cigarette since. So there you go. There you go. Years. You, you years. wouldn't think being a professional cyclist would prompt you to give up smoking, but carrying no. the torch does. Go <laughs> 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 hey, figure. Hey, hey, Grace, <laughs> you can come on the show anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Your form sensational on and off the bike. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, yeah, no, we really, really appreciate you being on the show, Grace. You've got a, a big uh, block of races coming up and, and we'll do everything we can to make sure that uh, you're on the start line of Liège. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'll leave it to you guys. <laughs> all right. Enjoy the super that little bed and say good day to Bart and the crew. Hope they're all going well. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All, all, all good. <laughs> Speak to you soon. See Bye. ya. Bye. See ya. That was Grace Brown. Sensational interview, Iffy. Uh, she's got a bit of cheek. I like that. Oh, she's a she's an amazing uh, young lady and, and a, a, a seriously good cyclist we, mm. who we haven't seen the best of yet. She is going to have a, an amazing year this year and next couple of years, I believe. Well, it, it was pretty interesting when she said that she wasn't picked to re- ride Liège. That doesn't make any sense. Well, she didn't say, yeah, she didn't quite say it that way. You're putting words in her mouth, but she, they, her program, they decided not to oh. ride Liège and ride other races, but... Hey, she went second in the damn thing last year, and she's also not riding the bronze appeal, which she won last year. But she explained that because of Paris Bay. But mm. um, yep, One, I jokingly, jokingly said I'll uh, I'll speak to those higher up, but uh, uh, they know what they're doing. But uh, and they must have their reasons for it. But yeah, that's right. Yep. yep. Uh, now, John, you've got a sale on. I think it's tomorrow. We so. Have- yeah, the bike bike exchange have got a a, a fantastic uh, sale on, um, which you can go online bikeexchange.com.au uh, and look for Green Edge Outlet X Team Issue Sale. Exactly, and it's going gangbusters. But tomorrow, anyone who's in the Melbourne area who wants to come out to Coast to Coast, so look up Coast to Coast. Uh, it's uh, just off uh, uh, Cooper Street in. Um, Campbellfield, Summerton, um, and it's I think it's ten o'clock uh, tomorrow, ten till, till two tomorrow. So get in there. There's some amazing um, deals going on. Well, tomorrow, I suppose we, it's, you need to clarify. It's the twenty seventh of March because if people listen to this Sunday, they are oh, sweet. We'll get down there Monday. It's not going to work. Well, it's not going to work. Yes. No. Right. <laughs> too late. She said. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that wraps another big show. We've got Tiff Cromwell lined up next week, uh, so that'll be an interesting chat. And we're going to have 
Michael Rogers. We're going to get him on to talk about esports and e-cycling because it's absolutely gone gangbusters in the uh, – because his role, I think last time we spoke to him, was all about what he's doing with the UCI. So that'll be an interesting chat as well. So stay tuned for that. And to do that, make sure you like, subscribe uh, on YouTube particularly and turn on notifications. So when we do go live, you'll get a notification uh, and you can join in the conversation on the show. Thanks again, Ify, and we'll see you all again next time on The Detour.